to apply convection to other planets, you need to think of what could happen if you change the gas involved. So, of course, as we said, we could change the, the condensable gas. But we can also change, uh, for example, what is the background gas, hydrogen. But then you really don't see uh, what could happen, because basically you have a gas, hydrogen or nitrogen is basically the same thing. It, it has the same uh, it, it has the same structure. Um, it's not particularly radiatively active. Um, so wh what does what does happen? But first, what do you care? Why do you care what could happen if you have convection in a hydrogen dominated atmosphere? Well, you can care because as we saw yesterday, it does happen and we, we do see it. Uh, so for example, you have the, you have here, uh, a cyclone. It's on, it's on Jupiter. And as we were talking about convection happening on very different scales, actually here, the scale of this cyclone is the Earth scale. You could fit the Earth in there. And basically, you see, for example, here clouds. They are not water clouds, they are ammonia clouds. And you see that they are actually high up because here or there, you can see the, the shadow that they, they cast over the, the lower uh, level uh, gas or clouds. So you do have convection and, and you do have very uh, extreme convection when you look, for example, at this, which is a, a, a well-known photograph of the, the, the Saturn Great White, White Storm where you actually, it's a, a couple uh, weeks or months after it began, and then you already see this big storm. You have the wind shear that uh, creates a trail, and then the, the storm had time to actually circle, uh, the, the trail has, had time to circle the planet. And so again, the question is, yes, but what, what, how does, how is this, ca could be different from what we just heard for Earth convection? And here it is. If you have Earth or, or your generic moist planet, here's how it goes. As we heard, you have your temperature profile that is going basically on a moist adiabat, so you have your moist troposphere, and you have your uh, humidity here. Q is a, what I call the, 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 the specific humidity, so the amount of water vapor per amount of dry air. And basically it goes down because you have to follow thermo, thermodynamic flow, and so, uh, as it's uh, at it's uh, warmer down there, you have more water vapor, and and it's uh, colder up there. You have a drier drier air, and then, of course, here as we heard, convection is mostly due to the thermal gradient that is caused by radiation. So basically, the fact that it's hotter there, but it's also also held by as we also heard latent heat. Oh. Sorry about that. So it's uh, held by latent heat, but it's also held by, an, by another uh, process we didn't hear about, which is the fact that you have a difference in mean molecular weight. So what is this? So basically in Earth, your background gas is, is nitrogen, and, and then the, 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 the mean molecular weight, so the weight of a, a molecule of nitrogen is 28. But then the, the mean molecular weight of water is 18. You have 18 nucleons in the, in the water molecule. And so basically what it does is that here, because you have more water, and that water is a bit lighter than nitrogen, it's a little bit less dense here than here. And so basically, you have another process helping you, because when you want convection, you want hot stuff, but why do you want? You really want less dense stuff. So here, because you have water, you have less dense, less dense air, moist air, that will be helped to get uh, a loft. So that's a buoyancy effect. So how does it change when you go to uh, a giant planet, for example? So the, the, the most important, well, one change is basically that you don't have a surface. But that doesn't change too much. So what basically happens is that in your atmosphere, in your planet, you have some deep abundance of your oxygen, or in, so basically of your water. And so basically what happens is that you still have your moist troposphere, and you have your water vapor uh, saturation that is trying to follow the, the thermodynamical law. And then at some point, it hits the, 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 the value of your deep interior. And then you, can have, you can't have more water than that. And so basically here, water stops to uh, condense. So you just have a constant or mostly constant amount of water. Then you have a dry troposphere. So now the lab straight is not a, a moist, Lab straight, but a dry lab straight. 
And here, that's uh, pretty easy because that's where you would expect clouds to be because you can't have clouds down below. The clouds, particles, they are not easy to loft too much, uh, too much higher than this. So basically, the deck, you, you should uh, have a deck of clouds pretty much at this level of transition between the dry and the moist troposphere. But what is really, really different is that whereas in Earth we had a profile of mean molecular weight like that, now we don't have N2 as a background gas. We have, we have H2. And H2 has a mean molecular weight of 2. It's tiny. It's not a fraction higher than water. It's 10 times lower than water. So actually, you can have a huge, a huge gradient of mean molecular weight but as you saw, the mean molecular weight gradient is not the same way as before. Here you have lighter water poor gas on top of heavier water rich gas. So you have a problem because you have, a, again, a battle or competition. Because you have a competition between your radiation that wants actually you to convect and this process that uh, tries not, that tries to suppress that convection. So how do you? How can we um, actually quantify that? So basically, you can come back to your convection 101 and, and, and try to understand first what would be the convection criterion in a, in a dry atmosphere. And basically, this is this. You have your density in the atmosphere as a function of height. And here, the dotted line is the, the density profile that you would have in your atmosphere with some thermal gradient uh, Nablet. And then you have your adiabatic gradient. This is the gradient of density that a, a particle would follow if it were moved in the atmosphere adiabatically, so without any exchange of heat. So let's try to have a, 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 a particle here. So you take a given particle of air, and basically you move it for some reason. You have a disturbance that moves it up, and here it moves on the adiabatic profile, and then here, because it's denser than its environment, it will be pushed back by buoyancy, and you have a stable atmosphere. Now what happens if you have the, 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 the reversed, uh, the reversed um, uh, conditions? Here now, your gradient in the atmosphere is uh, bigger, and if you have your uh, parcel of air uh, going up, then, uh, you're less dense, and you, uh, your, your particle is uh, pushed up again, so a little disturbance is further amplified, and that's what we call convection. And that means that your convection happens basically when your uh, gradient is bigger than the adiabatic gradient, and that's what we call the well-known Schwarzschild criterion. Now, as I said, we want to include mean molecular weight. We want to add another another parameter. So we have to go a little bit further. And then, again, we have our thermal gradient. But what can happen is that you can add a gradient. Oh, this will come. There you go. So you have your particulate that went up. Now, the thing is, in your environment, you don't only have a thermal gradient. You also have a gradient of the heavy element. OK? So as you see here, you would imagine that your uh, particle is, for example, uh, lighter than its environment. But as you see, the color is not the same. So here, this particle, it still has the same composition as here. And basically, this is uh, shown what, what, uh, by, by this term here, the gradient of mean molecular weight in the environment can offset the effect of temperature. And basically, you see that it's a negative sign. So basically, if you have more uh, EV stuff below, it will uh, stabilize your atmosphere. And so, the, so that's what can happen here, where basically your density gradient will be uh, a little bit lower. And here is a new criterion to know whether this is going to be stable or not. And this is, uh, in, in, this is a LODO criterion. And this is basically involving your thermal gradient, your uh, mean molecular weight gradient in the, uh, in the environment, and your adiabatic gradient. But of course, as we saw, the problem is here, uh, this is only if you have no compositional change in your bubble, and it's because basically you have, uh, let's say, uh, dust or something that can be really advected without changing. 
But what happens, for example, if you have condensation? Because here, you see that uh, as your, your environment is going to have a gradient of temperature and composition, but then in your bubble, as it evolves, because there is going to be condensation, so there is going to be also a change in temperature and in composition. And you have to put thermodynamics in there. And so I guess you can uh, now understand that you have to add this more term. And that's where, uh, basically, uh, you can feel that it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get pretty messy, can't you? Don't you see the big equations coming? <laughs> so if you can't, it's either because you're very brave or very smart. Because actually, there is a very, very interesting thing happening. It's, it's the magic of, of thermodynamics. Because basically, if you're in a saturated atmosphere, it means that you're uh, gradient of mean molecular weight, or your gradient of water vapor, if you will, is going to be linked to the th thermal gradient just because uh, of condensation, condensation laws. So these two cannot evolve separately. And these two are the same. This one will, the, the, the condensation, so the, the, the amount, the saturation, will depend on temperature as well. And so basically what happens is that all this is proportional to the thermal gradient. All this is proportional to the thermal gradient and the thermal gradients disappear, and you have a magic new criterion where basically you just know that convection uh, is shut down whenever your amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is bigger than some magic critical abundance. And that depends only on the difference of the mean molecular weight between your vapor or your, your condensing species and your uh, non condensing species, and about the thermodynamical properties of your condensation, so basically the latent heat. So how does it go? What, what does it do to your atmosphere? So basically what happens is that um, you have here uh, your moisture atmosphere, a dry air bath. If you have uh, uh, an internal uh, amount of water vapor that is below this critical uh, value, you're fine. But when it's above this critical value, basically what happens, you start here to uh, suppress convection, and then you only have radiation to get your energy out. So you go, get a radiative layer, and so you have a very big increase in temperature. And somehow you hit again the, the value of your internal uh, amount of, of uh, water or, or, or the species, and then you fall back on the dry air bath. The question is, what species are interesting to do this? So what I did is just compute this for different species, and you can do it for, for all the others. But that doesn't tell you the whole story. You also have to look for what are the species that are really uh, abundant in, in the universe. And so you just uh, put in, the, for example, the solar abundance. And you see here the enrichment that an atmosphere should need to have to actually uh, uh, show this kind of behavior. And you see that the most uh, the most promising is, of course, is water. You only need a 10 times uh, solar enrichment, and then CH4, and then NH3, and maybe iron. But so, uh, so that's that's really interesting. So, what does it do? If you look at, uh, for example, Jupiter, here is a profile. So you just have the observed value at one bar for the temperature, and here is various profiles as, as you increase the amount of water vapor or the, the oxygen amount, if you will. In, in, in Jupiter. And what you see is that the, the internal temperature actually decreases with the amount of water vapor in Jupiter. But if you uh, account for this inhibition of convection, basically that completely changed the, the type of profile you would have, and that changed the internal temperature. So the thing is that I think it would be, uh, it could be maybe detectable with Juno, uh, although there, there may be some uh, problem of degeneracy in the measurements. But the problem is that it probably requires too high uh, amount of water. It's actually interesting because it does explain uh, the properties of Saturn. And so if you want to put that in the exoplanet context, of course, you can think of runner greenhouse, for example, in, in hydrogen atmospheres. But now I want to quickly move to another area, which is what, why does that matter to brown dwarfs? So of course, brown dwarfs are maybe not that metal rich. But where does compositional convection could play? So there is this uh, long-standing problem that 
When you go to the, see the brown dwarf sequence in the color magnitude diagram, you have this wiggle here that we call the MLC transition. And the problem is that you need to have something to actually explain this. And to explain this, uh, basically, you need to redden all these L dwarfs. And to redden a brown dwarf, you need to decrease the brightness temperature, the brightness difference uh, between uh, the, your, um, to decrease the brightness temperature in the near infrared. To do that, you have mostly one way, which is to put something high up, like clouds or dust, uh, if you will, that will emit higher from colder regions. And then you can expand that. Of course, the problem is that there is some parameterization going on. So there has been another idea in the, in the literature, which is to basically cool down uh, the deep atmosphere. And that does the same without clouds. But of course, I just want to remind you that even though this could work, uh, I don't exactly see how you could have brown dwarfs without clouds because you have condensing things, so they need to condense at some point. But anyway, let's try to work it with, with this. And uh, so there was this really interesting by, uh, idea by uh, Pascal Trombone, who's going to talk just after, which is the fact that this transition actually occurs at a chemical transition between CO-dominated and CH4-dominated atmospheres. And that's interesting because if you look at the CH4-dominated atmosphere, you basically have an atmosphere like this. This is a little bit colder. You have uh, CH4-rich gas all the way. And so your mean molecular weight doesn't do anything, and it's stable. If you go to a little bit hotter uh, things, then you have CO gas down there and CH4 rich gas up there. The thing is that the CH4 rich gas is actually uh, a bit uh, heavier than the CO gas. And so basically this is potentially unstable. And so that would lead to mixing. And that's what I really loved about this idea because it, it's really, um, you, you think this unstable, instability should really occur. What I didn't so much like about this idea is that uh, the way they implemented this mixing was mostly uh, making it act like uh, diffusion. And that makes sense. So basically what uh, they did is saying, okay, we have a turbulent flux like, that we write like this. So if we have some mixing process, we increase the, this KZZ. So to have the same flux, we just decrease the, the thermal gradient. And basically you go from a stable atmosphere uh, that is like this, to a more hypothermal atmosphere. And it kind of makes sense as well, because intuitively you would think, okay, we have, to, we have mixing. So basically what does mixing do, as we heard for, for the Earth? You take energy there and you put it there, and so you kind of always put energy apart, so you, you would put to, to more hypothermal conditions. The problem is that it's actually what happens when you have a, 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 a convectively unstable region. But here, you're forcing mixing in a convectively stable region. And so actually what does happen is that mixing mixes entropy. It doesn't mix temperature. So basically, it's not, uh, the turbulent flux is not written like that. It's written like that, as a flux of turbulent of, of entropy. And so basically, when you, amount the, when you uh, uh, augment, when you increase the turbulence by any process, what you do is not going to more, more isothermal, you go toward the more adiabatic conditions. And, and even though it's counterintuitive, the, 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 you can show uh, from the hydrodynamical literature, there are th theorems that show that actually in a stable atmosphere, if you mix, you actually go toward the adiabat, you actually bury heat. So you have a, a negative flux of heat. And basically, instead of uh, of going to more uh, isothermal conditions, you have more adiabatic conditions. And so instead of decreasing the temperature of the lower atmosphere, this actually increases the temperature of the, 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 higher, the, the lower atmosphere. So like that, I don't think this process can really, really work. However, uh, I know that Pascal, uh, after a lot of this, well, he, he worked a lot and he actually found a way, uh, I think, uh, to uh, actually make it work if your convection now is not at the, at the batting, as I said, but if there is uh, some source of energy, and in this case, I think radiation, uh, powering this radiation. And I think that, or at least I hope, this is a good transition to the next talk. And with that, I'll thank you and take your questions.
just one question for Jeremy. Hi, Hugo Lambert, uh, University of Exeter. Have you thought about the effect of convective entrainment when you move to the giant planet, planet atmospheres? In other words, where you have, so you have these plumes of rising fluid, and on Earth what happens is if, if those enter uh, a dry region, then it pulls in dry air, and that tends to damp down the convection. But if you're pulling in a lighter fluid, like hydrogen, I mean, what happens? I have no idea, actually. Uh, well, the thing something is, to work on then. Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, we're we're trying, and uh, Pascal is, is trying to to actually uh, resolving flows of, of this kind of thing because uh, it's really where you can see this kind of effect because you're going to resolve the entrainment, and uh, so maybe next exo time. Question here, and then Hi. Um, the, in terms of the inhibition at high abundances um, for, say, water with Jupiter or whatever, um, it seems like uh, the criterion that you described is basically a local criteria, and it looks just very sort of, you know, um, you know instantaneous, uh, or not instantaneous, but very in infinitesimal kind of perturbations given some local gradient. And it seems like you can potentially get around that criterion if the convection is non-local. Like if you have... Um, external perturbations, large-scale waves or whatever, that push the parcel up by a finite amount, um, then uh, basically it condenses, and then you can um, bring out the, the, the condensate. And so in that, in that case, you have removed the thing that inhibited the convection, namely the molecular mass drops back down to something approaching two, and yet you still retain the, the latent heating effect, which is the point factor. Mm -hmm. So it seems like that could sort of circumvent the whole um, you know, criterion. Well, it could. It could. Um... What gives me some confidence, at least, that maybe uh, your fi the finite effect that you, you describe maybe needs to be too big, uh, is that actually, uh, so it seems to be observed in some 2D, uh, in some 2D uh, modeling, so basically where, where you have this finite effect. Uh, oh. and, um, and the other thing is, so of course it's a, it's a, it's a long shot, but uh, there is some evidence that actually the, 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 the great white storms and Saturn, the, the, the spacing between them, the, the, the time between them, is actually uh, consistent with exactly uh, the, the predictions of this model. Because basically, where you have this model, you have a, the radiative barrier. It has some depth in Saturn, and uh, the, 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 the radiative time scale of the atmosphere above this barrier that is a bit decoupled from the bottom, is exactly the time scale between the two uh, between two big eruptions, and so basically that's what was showed by uh, Lee and Ingersoll that you can actually have your big storm event uh, heating up the atmosphere, and you need exactly to cool down just the, this atmosphere above this radiative layer, and then up you start up again, and so you build all this energy, and that's why we have such great storms in Saturn. So, but last question, my friend. Yeah, so there, you mentioned the question about mixing entropy versus mixing um, temperature, but the problem, uh, entropy is not conserved under mixing. So, so it's true that you want to shut off the mixing when you're on the adiabat, but, but actually the thing that's conserved during convection is enthalpy. Yeah. Uh, in mixing enthalpy, but you don't want to mix enthalpy either because that's, that's like mixing temperature. So actually the right thing to do, I think, is to mix enthalpy, but to have the KZZ uh, go to zero as as the uh, gradient and entropy goes to zero. So it's not. I think neither neither of this mixing is quite right. But no, no, no. Of course, of course, there is some. I mean, what you're mixing in the end, uh, if you have a strong mixing, your entropy is constant, even though it's not conserved from the beginning to the end. But that's, that's right. End, but the, 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 the diffuse, diffusing entropy yeah. leads to the case where your entropy, your integrated entry, is the same at the beginning and the end. So that, that's why if you just do KZZ with entropy, it, it'll give you the wrong but answer. That's not what I did. Oh, yeah. Oh. It, it's, it's not, I, I mean, uh, here I, I'm not putting any numerical models. It's actually uh, only analytical things. What I'm just showing, and I mean, you can look at the paper. There is a, uh, just a, a, a proven theorem. You take the equations and you can show that in an atmosphere where, when you're in a stable region, if you do mix, you will... Uh, actually have flux downward, so you will heat up the lower atmosphere. So it's just, just that. Oh, thank Thanks you. Thanks again, Jamie.